everyone. My name is Vicki Goodman, and on behalf of the Friends of the Semmel Institute, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this evening's open mind presentation on SNAP, Change Your person Personality in 30 Days. Now, on the way over here, my fellow board members thought it was 30 minutes. <laughs> and Dr. Small said that that will be his next book. <laughs> Um, but we are all very excited to hear Dr. Small speak. Um, as you probably all know, he's a professor of psychiatry here at the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA. And he's also the director of the Longevity Center at UCLA. And um, he's also going to teach us all how to stay young and vital and um, just be super agers. Um, Gary Small is... Uh, a celebrity neuroscientist. You've probably seen him on CNN, on Good Morning America. Um, he has been on the Today Show, on PBS, and he's considered one of the world's leading innovators in science and technology. He has written, and correct me if I'm wrong, 10 books. I counted last night, I believe it's 10 books, um, including the New York Times bestseller, The Memory Bible, which was featured at the very first Open Mind program that we ever did back in 2004 in the living room of my home. Um, and that was the, the very first beginning of the Friends of the Semmel Institute. So uh, Dr. Small has a very special place in our heart. Um, Gigi Morgan, who has written, produced, and appeared in numerous television projects and films, including Jaws 2, oh um, and, and did that all before teaming up with her husband, Dr. Gary Small, to co-write The Memory Bible, The Memory Prescription, The Longevity mm. Bible, The Eye Brain, The Other Side of the Couch, and The Alzheimer's Prevention Program. Mm. Now, before I ask Dr. Small to come up to the podium, I just want to say a couple of things about um, our upcoming programs. Um, on May 20th, on March 20th, I'm sorry, uh, we will feature uh, the documentary film Out of My Head about migraines uh, with the filmmaker Susanna Styron and Dr. Andrew Charles, who is a professor of neurology and holds the Meyer and Rini Ruskin Chair in Migraine and Headache Studies. Um, that will be on March 20th. On April 5th, we'll welcome back Dr. Stephen Hinshaw. Uh, his book is Another Kind of Madness, A Journey Through the Stigma and Hope of Mental Illness. On April 8th, we will hold our second Friends and Family Open Mind event, uh, which is on a Sunday, and we are going to be screening the film Coco. And the director will be with us that day, along with three esteemed uh, faculty members to talk about music, memory, and um, the brain. So we're very excited about that. And just one more announcement, on May 2nd, Together with the Resnick Hospital Board of Advisors, the Friends are going to be presenting our very first inaugural women's conference. It's called the Wonder of Women's Summit, hashtag wow. Um, it will feature speakers such as Candace Bergen, um, her writer Diane English, Tipper Gore, Ambassador Nancy Rubin, and many UCLA luminaries in health and science. So I hope that you will all join us for those events. Uh, the calendar is on our website, friendsofthesemmelinstitute.org. Um, you'll also find information about our scholar program, our past events, and of course, if you're interested in becoming a member of our friends community, our open mind community, you will also find a link where you can join us and support the open mind programs. So, oh, and after Dr. Small's presentation, there will be a Q&A, and unlike most of our Q&As, it will not be on index cards. Uh, we're gonna be passing around the microphone. So if you have questions, uh, you'll have an opportunity to ask Dr. Small. So without further ado, Dr. Gary Small. Yeah.
Thank you, Vicki, for that lovely introduction. And uh, the memory has been, I guess, I can't even do the math, but it was 2004 when we did that first Open Mind event. And it's really uh, come a long way. You, you just do such a marvelous job. I also want to thank Wendy Kelman and the rest of the staff and supporters of the Friends for helping this with this event. Also, our Longevity Center staff for helping us this evening. And uh, I, before I get started with uh, the content, I know you're all eager. You all want to change your personalities. You have to <laughs> bear with me. I, I have a couple of announcements. Uh, first of all, I want, you know, we're the Longevity Center. We have some material in the back that we're passing out. And if you're interested in what we're talking about tonight, we have a, a conference coming up in the middle of the month, March 16th through the 18th, which will be focusing on relationships. And it's a marvelous conference. It's a three-day conference. You can come to one day, three days. Uh, we did it last year, and it was just extraordinary. It's not just informational, but it's experiential. So pick up one of these, find out about this conference. It's, it's really lovely. And then one other announcement, and I'll get right into it. Uh, you're going to want to change my personality before I get done here. <laughs> There's a, a flyer, are you a super ager? So one of our studies right now uh, is looking at the brain of people across the lifespan. But we're having a little bit of a challenge recruiting people in their 70s, 80s, and 90s. So if there are any of you, you don't have to reveal your age. You can uh, just pick up one of these flyers and... Uh, one of the things I see on here is you could earn up to $400 for participating. So then you could pay for this conference. It'd be fantastic. If you want, we'll just transfer the money. It'll be wonderful. So let's talk about personality. So how many of you would like to be more successful at work or school? Anybody? Okay. That, that makes sense. Who here wants to improve their relationships or themselves in some way? Okay, I saw a lot of hands go up very quickly. You know, just, just to digress for a second, it turns out that the, a very recent survey on personality change found that 78% or more of people want to change their personalities in some way. At any age. That's from people in their teens all the way up into their 70s and 80s. So you're not alone. You're in good company. And that's what I'm going to be talking about today. I'm going to show you how to do it, how to change your life, improve it, by starting with you, your personality. And basically what I'm going to do is cover these few areas here. I'm going to talk about how we measure personality. It's going to be a bit of a lecture. We're at the university, and I want to try to impart on you how important this science is, because it's, it's really quite extraordinary. The, the research that got... Gigi and me to, to work on this book. And we'll talk about that research, how it's really turned personality science upside down. And then I'll talk a bit about how we can apply these discoveries into practical strategies and really make a difference in our lives. So let's start out with the definition. What is personality? And the term actually is derived from the Latin word persona which refers to the theatrical masks worn by actors to display their various roles or to hide their true identities. But today we think of personality as incorporating an individual's characteristic patterns of thoughts, feelings, and behavior. So how we feel and how we think drives our behavior. And that's really how we display ourselves to the world. And these traits that are personality are relatively consistent over time. Now, if you think about the various people in your life, you could probably come up with a lot of adjectives to describe them. So, you know, you probably know people who are bold, or people who are calm, or shy, or arrogant. And we could go on and on with lots of different adjectives. And sometimes a generally positive trait can convert to a negative one if it becomes too extreme. So somebody may be flexible and agreeable, which is an asset, but being too flexible could make you indecisive and afraid to take a stand. 
Extroverted and outgoing people attract friends. So that's a definite positive trait. But if you go too far, you can become intrusive and annoying. So there's got to be a balance. Personality traits are relatively consistent over time. And they differ from mental states or emotional states, which are short-lived, like depression episodes or anxiety episodes. Now, here's an example that helps illustrate the difference between a personality trait and an emotional or mental state. One of my patients was a chronic worrier. He had relatively high anxiety that was consistent over time. It would go up and down a little bit. One day, a close family friend got in a car accident. And this individual's anxiety shot through the roof. He got very upset. He thought he was having a heart attack. And he went to the emergency room. In fact, that may be his doctor calling right now, I think. <laughs> so he went, he went to the emergency room. And fortunately, it was not a heart attack. Diagnosed a panic disorder, gave him a mild tranquilizer. And his anxiety came down. And so he went back to his usual chronic anxiety state. So if we plot his worry level or anxiety versus time, this is what his personality trait was. You see, it's a little bit above average. It went up and down a little bit each day. Something might be making him more or less anxious. That's his personality trait. But that day that his relative got in a car accident, he had a panic attack. That was an emotional state. Once that calmed down, he went back down to his usual ang anxious state over time. Now, research psychologists have many methods of describing and measuring personality. And they've used a statistical method called factor analysis to try to look at the different clusters of these adjectives that we talked about and see where they group together. And they found that most of these descriptors of personality fall into five major categories, what they term the big five personality domains. Each person's personality consists of a combination of these various traits in these groupings. Extroversion, conscientiousness, agreeableness, emotional stability, and openness. So to get a better idea of these different domains, extroverts are outgoing, social, and energetic. They're assertive and bold. But some extroverts lack restraint, and they take unnecessary risks. Conscientious people are masters of efficiency and self-control. You can count on them to get the job done, but too much conscientiousness can lead to obsessive compulsive behavior. Agreeable people are friendly, they're sympathetic, warm, they're considerate of your feelings, but when they become too agreeable, others take advantage of them. Emotionally stable people are calm and self-confident, which is the opposite of the moody, temperamental, and high-strung traits that characterize neuroticism. And then finally, open individuals, they like adventure, they welcome challenges, they're creative and imaginative, and they enjoy intellectual stimulation. So why is personality so important? Because our personalities clearly have a major impact on our lives. If you're conscientious, you'll be more successful in school and on the job. You'll also take better care of your health, and you'll live longer. If you're agreeable and extroverted, you're going to have more friends, and that's going to reduce your stress, and you'll have a lower risk for depression. And it turns out that our personalities influence almost every aspect of our lives, our relationships, career success, health outcomes, and even life expectancy. Many of us share personality traits, but no two people have the exact same personality style. Also, one particular trait does not entirely define the individual. Now, we hear a lot about personality disorders, which occur when personality traits become extreme and they disrupt a person's life. So if somebody is excessively shy, they, that could develop into an avoidant personality disorder. Those who lack empathy and can't distinguish right from wrong are antisocial personality disorders. Sometimes we use the term sociopath. Extreme emotional instability 
is characteristic of borderline personality disorders, and excessively self-centered people suffer from narcissistic personality disorders. Now, the good news is that only about 10% of the population has a personality disorder where it really disrupts their lives. But most of the other 90% of us still have room for change, and as I mentioned, many of us want to change. It also turns out that if you change your personality, that may very well change your brain structure. University of Minnesota scientists have looked at MRI scans and categorized research volunteers according to their personality traits. And they find certain areas of the brain are larger in certain personalities. So for example, the medial orbital frontal cortex, which is in the front part of the brain, the thinking brain, it's larger in extroverts. And that makes sense because extroverts are always seeking out pleasure and excitement and the part of the brain that's involved in the reward system is in that region. Or another area in the thinking brain, the uh, prefrontal cortex, is a lateral prefrontal cortex, which is larger in conscientious people. And that's the part of the brain that's involved in planning skills and thinking ahead, which conscientious people are always doing. And another area of the brain, underneath the temples, the medial temporal cortex, is larger in people who are emotionally unstable. And that makes sense too because the amygdala, one of the emotional control centers of the brain, is underneath the temples in that region. Now even though personality traits are relatively stable over time, they can change to some extent from major life experiences, both positive and negative experiences. And gradual change can occur from in-depth psychotherapy, psychoanalysis, for example, over many years, or with age, which makes us more conscientious and less anxious. But this degree of change is very modest and takes decades. Most mental health professionals, including myself, were taught to assume that true core personality change is fundamentally, or excuse me, true core personality traits are fundamentally set during childhood. So this is what we all believe to be the case. But now, startling new research has turned this assumption upside down, really contradicts this long-held belief. The latest science points to a new conclusion that has dramatically reversed our assumptions about how and how rapidly personality can change. For the first time, investigators looked at it systematically. They actually looked at personality traits as outcomes in studies. In their landmark study that was published very recently, psychologist Brent Roberts and his colleagues at the University of Illinois performed a meta-analysis, which is a statistical way of combining information from many different studies. And, and many investigators feel that meta-analysis is one of the most robust ways of proving scientific hypotheses. And what these investigators did, they carefully looked at all the scientific studies that had been done, looking at psychotherapy treatments, other types of interventions, even self-help approaches, where the study included a control group, so a group that was getting a placebo or no treatment at all, and had very careful design, and had enough subjects in the study to be able to make reasonable conclusions. So these were very well-designed studies that they looked at. And from all the literature, they were able to identify 200 studies, a little bit over 200 studies, that assessed these big five personality domains looked at it systematically. And in those studies, they had over 20,000 subjects. 63% of them were women. And there was a, a wide age range from 19 to 73 years. Now, it was important to level the playing field in these studies so they can compare the different outcomes. And to do that, they used another statistical measure called the effect size. And essentially what the effect size is, it's a way of comparing a real intervention like psychotherapy 
with some control intervention or being on a waiting list. And so the effect size gives you a number from zero to one that tells you how well the intervention performed compared to a placebo. And a small effect size is considered less than 0.2. 0.3 to 0.5 is considered moderate, and anything over 0.6 is considered a large effect size. So when the scientists pooled all the results from this mar large meta-analysis, they drew a remarkable conclusion. Both treatments with mental health professionals and self-help interventions resulted in positive outcomes on personality measures. And the type of therapy didn't seem to matter when it came to personality change. Cognitive behavioral therapy, mindfulness intervention, psychodynamic therapy, medication treatments, and other interventions demonstrated comparable benefits in levels of personality change. Whether or not the volunteers are being treated for depression, anxiety, or no mental disorder at all, they still got better. The bottom line was that personality traits consistently improved in the full range of subjects in these studies, and the improvements measured by the effect size were not small. Usually they were moderate, even larger than what you often see in clinical trials of medications eventually approved by the FDA. Another thing that Professor Roberts and colleagues did was they charted the treatment effect versus its duration. And in this slide, we can see the results for one of the personality domains, emotional stability. And you see on the vertical axis is the effect size, and the horizontal axis is the intervention duration. And you notice that as you move up the curve, it plateaus at, guess what? 30 days. Quite remarkable. And then it levels off. And it turns out that the effects in these studies were sustained long after the intervention was discontinued. The surprising conclusion from the science is clear. We can change our personalities if we choose to. Change can be achieved in as quickly as 30 days. Also, a variety of self-help therapies work. So meaningful personality Improvements don't necessarily require the help of a trained professional, but in certain situations, it makes sense, and I'll talk about that in a moment. So when I first heard about this study, I was skeptical. But I delved into it, I read it in detail, and I thought, this is real, the real deal. So I uh, turned to my wife and co-author, Gigi Vorgan, and I talked her into writing this book with me so we could translate this science into a language so people could understand it. And if any of this is not clear, uh, Gigi's here in the front, she can help me out of it. Uh, but not only translate the science into a way people can understand the science, but into practical strategies so people can actually act upon the science. So to get a better idea of what we're talking about, let's start with one of the domains, extroversion. Take a little deeper look at it. Now, usually people have a pretty good idea of whether they're extroverts or introverts. So just by a show of hands, how many of you think you're an extrovert? OK, about 70%. How many of you think you're an introvert? OK. How many, anybody here too shy to tell us? <laughs> okay. so, so you can see people, their hands went up right away. And they have a, a pretty good sense of who they are. Now, to get an idea of how personality investigators measure these various traits, I'm going to show you 10 statements that extroverts generally endorse. And what I want you to do is silently count up the number of statements that you endorse yourself. And then we'll see what your rating is in a moment. Let's see if it coincides with what your first impression was. So I am comfortable taking risks. You don't, don't raise your hand, just count up your finger if it's true, okay? I work well in groups. I enjoy making small talk. Status and wealth are important to me. 
I become energized when I'm around others. I prefer spending time with friends over being alone. I'm more of a doer than a thinker. I like this one. I usually answer my phone before it goes to voicemail. <laughs> I often have a hard time settling down and concentrating. I'd rather talk about my ideas than express them in writing. Okay. So how many of you scored one to three? A few. Okay, so that's interesting. Only a few of you scored there, yet there were a much higher proportion of you who felt that you were introverted. How many from four to six? Okay, that's a much larger number. And what about those who scored seven or more? Those are the people who are bouncing up and true extroverts. Now, ec epidemiological surveys indicate that about a third of us are introverts. And usually, we're not the most popular kids on the block, but introverts have many assets. They're often, they have a few close friendships, rewarding friendships, and they're great listeners, and they're thoughtful. So they think through things before they make decisions. And uh, being good listeners, uh, they're great company for extroverts who like to talk a lot. <laughs> I mean, one way to, I, I, what, one person described it this way, and I think this is very helpful. If you're an introvert and you come home at the end of the day, you want some quiet time to just kind of decompress. If you're an extrovert, you want to talk about all the great things that happened during the day, and so forth. Now, it turns out that some people we think about, we assume are extroverts, are actually introverts. We think they're extroverts because they're around, they're around people a lot of times. They may be leaders, like Barack Obama is an introvert, or Steven Spielberg is an introvert. And it extroversion, introversion, occurs along a continuum, just like all of these personality domains. And in fact, most of us are ambiverts in the middle, and we will change uh, our extroversion level depending on the situation. So the positives and negatives of each of these traits are, we can see here, for, for extroverts, they're energetic, outgoing. As a result, they have extensive social lives or natural leaders. They have better health outcomes, lower stress levels, and longer life expectancy. But sometimes they come off as inattentive, always seeking attention, distractible, self-centered, superficial, and impulsive. <laughs> You're not thinking of anybody in particular, are you? <laughs> okay. Now, uh, by contrast, introverts, their positives would be the attentiveness I mentioned. They're focused, introspective, and they, they're self-sufficient. They, they don't need other people around to feel good. But they, too, can come off in a negative way as aloof, self-centered, awkward, or snobby. Regardless of where you are on the spectrum, on the spectrum, the introversion extroversion continuum is one of the personality domains that changes the most with intervention. So let's say you're shy and you'd like to become more extroverted. There are, there are plenty of studies showing that CBT or cognitive behavioral therapy, relaxation exercises can be very effective. Other strategies that can dial up your extroversion quotient include opting for enjoyable social activities. So if you're an introvert and you feel funny about going out, try to go to something that you enjoy. It'll be a lot easier. You can even practice having conversations to make it less awkward. Or uh, another tip that I think is very helpful is reframing anxiety into energy. On the other hand, if you think you need to dial down your level of extroversion, there are strategies that can be helpful there. You can practice listening to others, can practice spending some time alone and see how it feels. Become mindful of that. And you can even learn to prompt other people during conversations. But what about conscientiousness? Let's take a few moments to look at that. I mean, clear advantage, advantages to being conscientious. These are people who are organized, punctual, thorough, trustworthy. They, they have a greater li likelihood to succeed in almost any area of life. They're better able to find a job and keep it. They earn higher salaries, get better grades at school, they enjoy better health, 
And there's the careless conscientious spectrum as well. At the far end of conscientiousness, of course, is obsessive compulsive behavior, where people are so conscientious they can't function in life. It completely disrupts them. And there are strategies here, too, that can help people become more conscientious. And some of them are very simple and practical. Creating to-do lists or learning to set priorities and practicing planning ahead, creating routines. Many of us are multitasking these days with our gadgets and we have this sense that we're getting more done, but actually we make more errors and it distracts us. So trying to put aside the multitasking, even learning to meditate can help you focus more on the here and now and help you become more conscientious. Getting a good night's sleep, a lot of the uh, healthy brain strategies I often talk about are great for conscientiousness. In fact, one study found that physical exercise can actually help people gain more self-control and delay gratification just from that simple approach. Being agreeable is a tremendous asset. These people <laughs> are very friendly and considerate and helpful, supportive. They have strong social ties, better health outcomes, and greater success in life. But you can be too agreeable. You can be duped by other people and gullible. And then, you know, the worst part of the over-agreeable person, I think, is when they become passive-aggressive. Quite annoying. And we all can, all can recognize those passive-aggressive statements. I'm on my way. It was only a joke. I didn't realize you wanted it now. Or one of my favorites. You look great for someone your age. <laughs> and of course, there's one I didn't list, but my, my children love it. Whatever. <laughs> you know, if, it is possible to engage in strategies to improve your level of agreeableness. You know, one thing I think is important, you know, a lot of times people get sweaty, and they don't quite know why it is. And a great strategy, if you notice yourself feeling grumpy, be a little self-reflective and find out what's eating at you, what's bothering at you, what's bothering you in the moment. That way you're less likely to take it out on other people. Other things, uh, the simple anger management strategies can be quite helpful, where you learn to talk about the issues and not the person. And if things get too heated up in a conversation, you can take a time out and re-engage when you've calm down. Also, learning strategies to listen and acknowledge when you're wrong can be very help, helpful, as well as psychotherapy. What about emotional stability versus a neuroticism? We all know about the irritability and the moodiness and indecisiveness of neuroticism. Highly neurotic and emotionally unstable people have trouble coping with everyday life challenges. So we all strive for the serenity and the balance of emotional stability. And the neuroticism stability spectrum ranges from being depressed and anxious and temperamental to being calm, self-confident, and secure. And here, too, there are quite a number of strategies that are quite effective to help people become a more, more emotionally stable from different forms of therapy, mindfulness interventions, relaxation training, and again, some of these lifestyle habits like exercise, healthy nutrition, and restful sleep. And then finally, the close to openness continuum has its range and its pros and cons. And there are a number of strategies to help us become more open, like mindfulness, meditation, improving listening skills, and stepping out of our routines. Now, to get a better understanding of how all this works, because it may seem a little bit abstract and a little conceptual, let's consider one of the case studies from our book, SNAP. And I'm going to be briefly talking about Beth, who is a 31-year-old high school teacher who had been living with her boyfriend, Ethan, for about three years. Beth wanted to start a family, but Ethan wasn't interested in having children. 
They had tried couples therapy, but no one was willing to budge. Beth knew that if she were ever going to have kids, she would need to do something proactive and probably wouldn't involve staying with Ethan. She'd been thinking about leaving him, but she wasn't quite ready to do that. At this point, Beth was not truly ready to change. Behavioral psychologists have developed various theories to explain behavior change. And in SNAP, we summarize these models and theories to help to determine a person's readiness for change, to formulate a plan and to achieve their goals. And we call them the CPAS, C-A-S. One of those letters stands for one of the four major phases when people are trying to change, considering, planning, acting, and sustaining. So during the considering phase, we're ambivalent. Thinking about it, but we're not quite sure we're going to go forward. We've got a lot of excuses, and there are barriers to change that maybe we haven't entirely identified. In the planning stage, we've gotten over the first hump, and we know, we really know we want to change, and we're motivated to plan a specific strategy. That gets us into the acting phase when we get into it. We begin therapy or self help strategies or both, and that's the 30-day period, when we start adopting new behaviors, new ways of thinking. But after that 30 days, we get into the sustaining phase. And here we need strategies to maintain those new behaviors so we don't have a slip and fall back to the old ways. Now, Beth was clearly in the considering stage at this point. She had lots of excuses and barriers, and she was ambivalent about changing. So to help her move forward, she worked with her therapist to explore ways that she was holding herself back. So she began to articulate her goals, which gave her some insight into her barriers for change. So if we look at uh, this list, we see some of Beth's goals and some of her excuses. So she wants to have a relationship with someone who wants kids. But she tells herself, I know Ethan loves me, and I'll be lonely if I break it off. That's her excuse. She wants to give Ethan an ultimatum and tell him to move out. But she hates confrontations. He'll, he'll eventually get the idea and move out. <laughs> she wants to, to get out and meet people with similar interests. But she tells herself, it's too much work to meet new people and to go out on dates. And, you know, this is what a lot of people go through. I mean, a lot of people talk about change, but they're really too ambivalent to do anything about it. But the first step is to really identify these goals, overcome these barriers. And in fact, with Beth, she was able to do that. But if we look at uh, what other people do, we can see, well, let me get back to Beth for just a moment. She, she defined her goals, and she completed a uh, personality questionnaire, and I'll get to that in a moment, but if you look at when people set goals and they understand their baseline personality, they can kind of align their goals to the personality change they need. So here's some examples. You have a goal of overcoming fear of conflict. I mean, that was one of Beth's goals. Well, becoming less agreeable might help. We talked about agreeableness as a positive trend. In this situation, it may not be so positive. Let's say you want to improve your marriage. Well, that might call for becoming more agreeable. Personal growth, maybe emotional stability is what you need to achieve. A better social life, become more extroverted. Career success, probably more conscientiousness for many people, or in some jobs, becoming more agreeable would be important. Now, if we go back to Beth for a moment, she did a baseline personality assessment as one of the strategies in SNAP, and we can see that she was introverted. She scored very low on the extroversion scale. Also, she was not that open to new experiences. She was an overthinker and indecisive and a bit neurotic. That was another weakness, but she was very agreeable, maybe too agreeable. But another strength of hers is that she's conscientious, which means that she would follow up on anything she needed to do. So if we look at uh, Beth in her planning phase, 
She assessed her personality. We've got high scores in agreeableness and conscientiousness, low scores in extroversion, openness, and emotional stability. She defined her goals. She wanted to confront her boyfriend and eventually get out and date again. And aligning her goals to her desirable, desired personality change, she had to re reduce her agreeableness and increase her extroversion. Now, going through this process, you have to make some decisions. You have to think, well, do I want to see a therapist to do this, or do I want to do it on my own? And there are a lot of considerations that come into play. So for example, uh, people who have been helped by psychotherapy in the past, that might be a good idea to engage a therapist. Uh, also, if you feel that you're not a self-starter and you need a cheerleader, someone to motivate you, Getting a healthcare professional involved may be important. Also, if you have a psychiatric disorder that requires medication, psychiatrists may make sense. People with minimal psychological issues, self-help might be a good start. Or if they're self-starters, a self-help approach would be good. And if they've done well with self-help strategies in the past, that may make sense. And there's a whole algorithm to think about if you're going to choose a therapist and what to think about. How do you find a good therapist? I mean, of course, one of the best things to do is talk to people who you trust and find out what worked for them. Who do they know? Uh, people who are in therapy at the time may recommend their therapist or talk to their own therapist or contact UCLA or other trusted universities or organizations like the APA that can provide recommendations. Another thing is, has to do with practical considerations. You, know, you don't want to be driving hours and hours to get to your therapy appointment. So location is important, fees are important, and also if you have a preference for a male or female therapist, an older or younger therapist, I mean those are good things to keep in mind as well as your instincts around people. You know, is there chemistry? between you. If this therapist has no sense of humor and you have a sense of humor, it's not going to click and you're going to need to find someone else. And also you want to watch for red flags with certain therapists. If, they're, if they don't appear to be particularly empathic, if they behave inappropriately, or if they're overcritical, those might be red flags that this is not the right person for you. And then finally, you, you want to think about the form of therapy. And in SNAP, we go over each of these different scenarios and each of these different issues that are involved. And you can get an idea of the type of therapy that works for the type of issue that you're dealing with. And, uh, and also the type of counselor, the kind of tr their training and so forth. So if we we're summarizing some of these approaches to therapy options, you know, your first question is, do you prefer speaking with someone in person? And if so, then you've got to ask, well, do I want one-on-one -on -one therapy, which is the usual way people go, or do you want to be part of a group? If you don't want to talk with someone in person, there are other self-help or online approaches. So one-on-one -on -one is the most popular form of therapy, but couples would be great if there's marital discord or couples problems. And group is, is very good for people who need support from others. And then, of course, the self-help approaches. Uh, many of the therapies, like cognitive behavioral therapy, can be delivered online. So you can do that yourself. And there have been very well-performed systematic studies showing they work quite well. And video, telemental health, and so forth, as well as phone therapy. Now, I wanted to, uh, as director of the uh, UCLA Longevity Center, I wanted to talk about age for a moment because I, uh, people often ask about this. Am I too old to change? You know, will this stuff help me at this stage of my life? And I, and I do admit that this is a book that is targeting a broader audience and the audience that Gigi and I usually address, people middle age and older, they want to protect their brains. But it's clear to me, and looking at this in quite a bit of detail, that this is something for young, middle age, and older groups as well. So if you look at the studies on these various forms of intervention, 
whether it's psychodynamic psychotherapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, mindfulness intervention, whatever it may be. There have been well-performed studies in older adults. So you can teach an old dog new tricks. Age should not be the deciding factor. Also, the, the study I showed you earlier, the large meta-analysis from the University of Illinois, included volunteers all the way up to age 73. And I doubt that uh, you know, our personalities know that, oh, now I've turned 74, it's not going to work anymore. I assume that they just didn't include people in that older age group. So there is hope for us at any age. And in fact, you know, I also often hear this argument, well, aren't older people set in their ways? But in my experience, it's really more your baseline personality traits that determine whether you're going to change much more than your age itself. So to summarize a roadmap for personality change, the first question is, are you ready and motivated to change? You need to get through that considering phase and examine any excuses you have and overcome those barriers. Sometimes you can do that yourself. Sometimes you may need a therapist to help you poise yourself to start changing. That can get you into the planning stage where you start defining your goals. Is it your career that you want to work on? Is it your relationships? I often recommend you make a list and prioritize and not try to work on everything all at once but start with what's most pressing. Then do a personality inventory. Rate your baseline personality. That will help you understand your personality strengths and weaknesses. And then you can figure out how you want to go about it. Do you want a therapist? Do you want to do it on your own? Do you want both approaches? And choose the type of therapy with a mental health professional, self-help or even a combination of the two. And let me also say, in a perfect world, it does work in 30 days, but you may find you're 10 days into it and something's not working. Maybe you started out with self-help and it's not working for you. You may need to adjust it. You may go down, need to go down a different avenue to achieve your goals. And then finally, once you're there, once you're feeling better, you gotta figure out strategies to help sustain it. Because, let's face it, we're human. And we have a tendency to slip back to our old ways. And there are strategies, and we detail these in SNAP, on how we can anticipate those slips, even plan a, a managed slip so that we can convince ourselves that we can bounce back quickly and we have the tools to do that. So to summarize, recent research is, I think, very compelling that psychotherapy, self-help strategies are both can lead to meaningful personality change. It can improve our lives. It can occur very quickly, within 30 days. And it can be sustained. Not that difficult for motivated. Our baseline personality, align our goals to our personality change, and then enjoying the benefits from there. So anybody who would like more information about this, back, and I, any questions you have right now, if they're difficult questions, I'm going to pivot them to Gigi, because it will help me. Thank you so much. This is going to be a tough one, because uh, Dr. Huntsman, I think, is a personality psychologist, so I'm glad Gigi's here. Yeah, so the study didn't get into that in a lot of detail. It did get into a lot of detail about the meta-analysis and how they perform the study. So, you know, what triggers people is very different. Sometimes, uh, you know, people hit bottom. 
and they realize they're dead. And that motivates them. Often a negative experience will motivate them. Uh, it's just, it's so variable as to what triggers people. So I, I'm afraid that's, that, I would encourage you to take a look at it. It's really a very well-performed well study. And it's actually free online. You can find it. And we reference it in, in the book. So, yeah. So let, let's uh, so cognitive behavioral therapy. Thank you. That, that was uh, it was in my notes, but I got to get to it. So uh, and I'm obviously an extrovert. I like to listen to myself talk. Um, so cognitive behavioral therapy is a form of therapy that helps people understand thinking and behavior better, have some perspective on it, so they can change it. So for let's if we go back to Beth's case, she had actually a combination of psychodynamic therapy and cognitive behavioral therapy. So her, let me contrast that to psychodynamic, is when you look at uh, your past and you look inside yourself to get insights. And what she found in her psychodynamic side of the therapy was that, I think I'm losing this mic for some reason. Uh, Thank you. So in the psychodynamic part, she, she found out that she, that she was dealing with Ethan, the way she dealt with her mother. She didn't want to disappoint him. And so that insight helped her. And uh, the, the cognitive behavioral thing was very helpful when she got out in the dating world. So uh, you know, before, she, she would, before she'd go out on a blind date, she would make lists of the worst possible outcome, which is it was her old way of thinking, this guy's going to be a complete loser. So that would be on one end. And then the best possible outcome would be love at first sight, which probably wouldn't happen. And then a more reasonable outcome that, you know, this guy might be interesting and I might want to see him again. So it kind of treats it, the problem in a different way in a very practical manner to help people change their way of thinking they can change their behavior. Yes. Um, I was wondering, there's a book that's also become well, very popular recently. It's um, Don Clifton. It's that um, father of strength psychology. And it's through the Gallup. And they did all of these, um, um, what's the word? I just want, I need you. I've got a, the memory Bible. I got that other book. Right. <laughs> you signed it to Okay. <laughs> on your weaknesses and what needs to change about you. So I'm just wondering if you have any comments about that kind of a perspective that seems more positive and being accepting of figuring out, you could do this whole online survey and then you could figure out what, um, what your strengths are so you could build those up and understand some you might not even be aware of, but rather than changing. So the, so the question is this other approach where you focus more on strengths and you don't bother with the weaknesses. You know, there's a lot of approaches and uh, one size doesn't fit all. One of the challenges of not dealing with the weaknesses is that may be what's really holding you back. Uh, you know, and I, I focus tonight and in the book on the big five personality domains, but there are other ways of organizing the information on personality. So for example, um, uh, there's uh, the Myers-Briggs assessment, which has 16 different personality profiles. And um, uh, we did an exercise with this, and I, I read my profile, and it was, it was like reading a a fortune cookie on steroids. It was amazing. Uh, and, but what was interesting about how they presented it, it all started with the strengths. I mean, you're like this famous person. You do this great, and so you're all pumped up. But then they get into, you know, under stress, you might do this and this and this. So it made it easier to deal with the negatives. I think people, it's hard for people to look at the negatives about themselves. You know, another uh, a, a related issue that comes up uh, is with couples. It's very, you know, people, sometimes people say, well, a great way to cure yourself of any mental problems is get married. 
Because then you can see it's all in the other person, you know. <laughs> It's hard, to see, it's hard to see it in yourself, you know, and no matter how much you intellectualize it, it, it's hurtful to think, well, I have weaknesses. But if we have the emotional strength to do that, it can, it can really pay off. And the other argument for focusing on some of the weaknesses, uh, you can often see the greatest impact when people come in and they need a lot of work. I mean, you know, if we look at a uh, healthy lifestyle, when we do studies, a lot of times we will enroll people who are overweight or obese because we know we can help them the most by getting them on an exercise program, getting them on a diet. If people are already pretty healthy, we don't see that much change and it's hard to measure. Yes? Dr. Small, I have a simple question. I don't think I need that. I'm an extrovert. <laughs> uh, Do you want to come up on stage? And, okay. <laughs> no, 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 I, I've done that. Uh, no, simply this. Uh, it would appear to me from what you're discussing that your belief, uh, your shared belief, personality can be changed. So we're talking about nurture versus nature. Yes. I'm curious to know how much of personality is nature. Uh, Chem biochemistry obviously uh, changes the brain, but that also can be caused by right. nurture rather than nature. But how much is imprinted on us? In other words, you're a lousy person because your mother was a lousy person, you know, and was that nature or was that nurture? So uh, the, it depends on which personality domain you're studying, and so there's, there's some variability. But on average, it's about 50% genetics. So we do inherit a certain amount in our genes. But that means at least half is nurture. And so that means there's some opportunity to change, clearly. Yes? Um, there was a study of identical twins raised apart. And um, the man who did that study said that without doubt it was nature, not nurture, that was the most important thing in, in everybody. So you're saying it's 50-50, and that's uh, it's very different from the right. twin study. It, it can, when you interpret science, it can be confusing. And that, I know that study, and it was quite an extraordinary study from the University of Minnesota were these twins, identical twins, reared apart, and they chose the same names for their children, they smoked the same brands of cigarettes. It was really quite a same, very extraordinary, extraordinary situation. But if you look at all the studies of heritability, uh, it contradicts that. It's not 100% in all the studies. So that's, and you know, think about, if you think about if you have more than one child in your family, you probably notice they have very different, they may have very different personalities. And so some of this is genetic, but you know, there are other factors involved, yeah. With regard to that twin study, with regard to the twin study, if, if parents have twins and, and twins aren't adopted by different people and they're raised by the same parents, they're gonna have the same kind of nurture probably too anyway. Well, does anybody have, is anybody here an identical twin? No? Or, no? Well, you know, there, you can't, many, twi many identical twins are very close friends and they're very similar. But you do see identical twins who differ. They're not going to have the exact same experiences in life. There's going to be some difference. Other questions? Yes? Um, yes. I, uh, I was curious, in your process of writing this book and assessing the um, yeah, sort of expert. Um, <laughs> um, assessing the research that led you to, uh, to write this book. Um, I was curious, did you notice any particular trends with relationship to standard practices for things like rehabilitation centers with respect to, to this analysis of, 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 again, like you said, you're describing personality, potential for personality change in, in almost anyone um, for a bunch of different ages. Um, so yeah, I was wondering if there was anything in particular that, that stood out to you that also lines up or contradicts or, or just is completely different from 
standard practices uh, sought after for rehabilitation. So some, some of the, you mean rehabilitation for uh, alcohol or drug addiction, something like that? Yes. Yeah. So th some of the studies included in the meta-analysis were studies of people in rehab facilities. There were inpatient, outpatient studies. So it's clear that this could be something very helpful for people who have struggled with addiction issues. There's no question about it. And in fact, group interventions can be very helpful for those kinds of situations. We all know about 12-step programs and the support people get from those groups helps them get beyond the addictive behavior that is hurting their lives. Um, other questions? Uh, over here, Thelma, you have a question. Yes, I have a question. Okay, so you mentioned that baseline personality is the greatest indicator um, to successful personality change. But a third way to the book, you introduced two of the favorite people that you use as examples. I think their names were Jeff and Lisa. So in that I didn't know I was going to be tested. <laughs> in that particular situation, would you say it was the baseline of their personalities that indicated their ability to change? Or was it their want and their need to change for their relationship that really gave us that success story? Okay, so let me, let me just tell you briefly this scenario with Jeff and Lisa. So these... This was a couple who uh, were in couples therapy, and they were both extroverts. Uh, and, uh, you know, being in a couple where, where there are two extroverts, I understand that. Um, but there's always going to be someone who's a little more of an extrovert than the other. And in this situation, Lisa was more of an extrovert, so when they were together with other couples, Jeff would kind of be a little more quiet, and you know, he didn't mind that. But Lisa experienced it as passive-aggressive, and it annoyed her. And, uh, and he was a bit passive-aggressive when you looked into it. He, 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 got, he felt that she didn't really listen to him, and so forth. And so the goal in their couple's therapy was to help Lisa become more introverted when she was around Jeff, and to help Jeff become more extroverted. Uh, and, and usually it's something like a couple's issue or some, as we said before, what motivates people to change, there's a problem. Uh, you know, we saw the Memory Bible, for example. People read that book because they were already noticing memory issues. So unless you have, you know, if you feel life is great, why would you want to change? But the reality is, the studies show that most of us do to some extent. We always look for something a little better. And, you know, the book is, is actually one aimed to empower people that they can change, that psychotherapy doesn't have to be frightening. Or if they're really frightened of it, they can do some self-help approaches. And uh, it really can make a meaningful impact on their lives. Uh, maybe one more question, yeah. This is, this is a tough crowd, I'm telling you. Well, you know, one of them I, I gave already. I mean, you can uh, plan, let, let's say um, you, you have a fear, let's say you're introverted and you're frightened of going out and so forth, and you're really pushing yourself to be with others. Well, you could um, plan an introverted weekend, just hold up at home. And, uh, and then realize, after you do that, you can get beyond that. And that can reassure you that if you do have a slip, where you go back to your old ways, where you isolate, that you can get out of it. Another thing that's very helpful in sustaining change is acknowledging that you're going to mess up. You're human. And not judge yourself or be too hard on yourself. I think two out of three is good. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Do we all get to uh, call you in 30 days and, and, uh, and let you know how we're doing? For you, Vicki, 30 minutes. Oh. <laughs> anyway, let's give a round of applause. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you so much.